This meeting is being recorded. Good morning. Thank you for joining the RTC Board of Commissioners meeting. Mr. Chairman, staff is ready for you to begin the meeting. Thank you. Larry Brown, for the record, I'd like to call to order the April 9th, 2020 meeting of the RTC Board of Commissioners. RTC staff will begin with a roll call of board members, introduce staff on the line, and also touch on a few housekeeping items. Back to you, Marin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Marin Dubois, Management Analyst for the RTC, for the record. I will be calling your name in alphabetical order. Please confirm your attendance as I read your name. Councilman Stavros Anthony. Here. Councilman Isaac Barone. Here. Chair Larry Brown. Here. Councilman George Galt. Here. Commissioner Jim Gibson. Commissioner Gibson? I'll come back. Here. Oh, there you go. Mayor Carolyn Goodman. Here. Vice Chair Deborah March. Here. Mayor Kiernan McManus. Here. Director Christina Swallow. Here. Thank you. Also, please note that we have several RTC staff on the line for today's meeting. This includes Ms. MJ Maynard, CEO, Mr. David Swallow, Deputy CEO, Mr. Francis Julian, Deputy CEO, Mr. Mark Trosdall, CFO, Ms. Angela Castro, Chief Strategy, Policy and Marketing Officer, Mr. Greg Gilbert, RTC Outside Legal Counsel, Mr. J.P. Penuelas, Senior Director of Engineering, and finally, Ms. Eileen Pastor, Government Affairs Supervisor will be reading our public comments. As the Chairman mentioned, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. Please state your name for the record before <sighs> speaking. Voting will be done in an alphabetical roll call style after a motion is made for actionable items. Please wait for your name to be read to provide your vote. The Chair will call for any comments or questions after an item has been presented. Thank you, Chair Brown. Thank you. Turn it over to MJ. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, th okay, great. Thank you, Chairman Brown, members of the Commission, MJ Maynard, RTC CEO for the record. The first item on the agenda is to conduct your first citizens participation period. As you know, on March 22nd, 2020, the State of Nevada Executive Department issued Declaration of Emergency Directive 006 which suspended the requirement to have a physical location for public meetings. Pursuant to Directive 006 and for the health and safety of the community, this meeting is being held telephonically. To allow for public participation, the RTC has been accepting public comments via email at publiccomments at rtcsmd.com. Comments could be submitted to be read aloud or to be added directly to the backup for the record. RTC staff member Eileen Pastor will read the public comments received by the RTC. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, Bra Chairman Brown, for the record, this is the first time set aside for public comment. Time is limited to comments on items included on the agenda. Comments will be limited to the first 500 words, with the remaining words to be included in the written record. Eileen, do we have any comments? Thank you, Chairman Brown. This is Eileen Pastor, Government Affairs Supervisor. For the record, there are no public comments at this time related to the agenda. Thank you. We'll move on back to Ms. Maynard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. MJ Maynard, for the record. The next item is to approve the agenda. The agenda is in order and ready for approval. Any comments or questions yeah. from the board? Motion to approve. There's a motion on the floor. Let's take our roll call vote. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Marin Dubois for the record. Just a reminder that I will be calling your name in alphabetical order. Please call out your vote after I read your name. Councilman Anthony. Yes. Councilman Barone. Yes. Chair Brown. Yes. Councilman Galt. Yes. Commissioner Gibson. Aye. Mayor Goodman. Aye. Vice Chair March. Aye. Mayor McManus. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you have all ayes. All ayes and yeses recorded. That motion carries. Thank you. Again, MJ Maynard for the record. The next item is the CEO report. We do not have a report to bring you this month, but we'll be sure to have updates for you in May. Item four is the NDOT director's report, which Director Christina Swallow is on the line to give an update uh, for NDOT. Uh, thank you. We can advance to the next slide. Next slide. Can you advance to the next slide? Well, I'll go ahead and keep going uh, while we do this. So the first slide, um, as I do every meeting, is our safety slide. And uh, we have uh, good news to report March to March, um, so March 2019 to March 2020. The numbers are down. Um, you've probably seen some of the articles in the paper about this. Um, this year's numbers, there were only uh, 12 fatalities compared to 23 fatalities in March of last year. Um, that brings our year-to-year -year total also now back to fewer than last year um, with 57 compared to 61. And in Clark County, um, there have only been 34 fatalities this year so far compared to 44 fatalities last year. Um, the pedestrian fatalities are... Um, up overall across the state, but in Clark County, they remain flat. And unrestrained, unrestrained occupant fatalities continue to track lower than last year, which were lower than the, the year before. So overall, there are, are good signs. Unfortunately, um, I believe most of these numbers are because the volumes on the road are much lower. And what we're seeing is that we're starting to see a trend that the severity of the crashes that do continue to occur is up. Um, we're starting. We're continuing to see DUIs on the road, and um, that you know, driving impaired is is never acceptable, and especially now when the hospitals um, really need to be focusing on addressing the COVID virus uh, rather than vehicular crashes. And we're also seeing um, an increase in drivers um, traveling above the speed limit. So just a real reminder that um, while we um, are always thinking about the way we use our roads, now it's even more important than ever to make sure that we're using our roads in a safe manner. Next slide, please. All right, I wanted to talk a little bit about NDOT's COVID response. So we are, of course, implementing all of the governor's directives. We have roughly 1,200 of our team members are working from home, continuing to keep the program on track with the remainder of our team members, primarily in the field which is in this picture um, from the Centennial Bowl where um, they were participating in the stand down for safety that many of our industry partners participated in on Friday. Um, the intent of this event was to really make sure that the team members understood how critically important it is for them to uh, adhere to all of the guidelines to ensure their safety, the safety of their family members and the safety of our uh, industry partners. Also to ensure that the program can continue to um, move forward uh, during COVID. So some of the things you can see that they are standing, you know, six feet apart, maintaining social distancing, but also reiterating to them to wash their hands, not touch their face, you know, wipe down uh, equipment before and after the use to make sure that the equipment is uh, clean and safe, especially when it's shared equipment. And of course, our guidance to our team members in the field is continuing to evolve. We're also um, trying to make sure that those folks in the field are keeping um, not just keeping the projects going, but expediting wherever they can and really taking, be, uh, being aware of the benefit of having lower traffic volumes. 
And uh, we have yet to see, um, and we have not yet seen any impact to project delivery. All of the projects continue um, in design and in construction to stay on track um, to keep our program moving forward. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, ATM signs went live uh, this last month. We talked about it. We've talked about it a lot. I uh, just wanted to say this is probably the best time for the ATM signs to go live. As part of our COVID response, um, we're also starting to track, and I'm, I'm going to go over the images on the screen, but we're starting to track the volumes on the roads, and we've started and we've seen a trend. Um, pretty much all of the roads across the state are at least 40% down in volumes. There's many roads that are um, closer to 60 to 70 percent um, continuously and if not continuously on particular days of the week. So we're watching that to make sure that uh, we um, can anticipate any funding impacts that we will see and adjust the program accordingly. Um, with the volumes down as low as they are, it's a really good time to do the ATM sign launch because the people who are on the roads are being able to see and experience the ATM signs without also having to manage the additional traffic around them. On the screen, it's really small, but um, from the bottom going right to left upwards, so the opposite of how we normally read, um, you can see that we did actually have an incident since the signs have launched um, where we were able to deploy the signs. And the bottom right sign shows, a right corner image shows an advance warning of the speed limit slowing down the next sign, and it gives a, and a warning to the drivers that there's a crash ahead with the right two lanes closed. Speed limit remains the same. In the middle, on the far right, uh, you can kind of see, it's really tiny, that um, the right lane has the X on it telling folks to merge. The next sign tells that that lane is closed, and the lane immediate to the left is also now merging and getting ready to close. And then you can see the collision where both of those lanes are closed. All of the traffic has moved over. And then in the top row, you can see where the lanes have opened back up. I did try to address or point your attention to the HOV lane because it is, um, those signs are really small, but when the collision happened, the HOV lane also opened to traffic um, so that anyone could use that lane as they navigated around the, the crash. So the signs are active, they're working, and uh, we're starting to see the benefits already. And then the last slide, I just wanted to talk about one other thing that we're doing during COVID, which is we have uh, launched the walk, the walk and Roll Wednesdays. Um, uh, according to the governor's guidance, we can certainly still, as long as we maintain social distancing and safety protocols, we can still get outside and, and NDOT is encouraging folks to do that. We know that when we um, move, um, that there are positive mental and physical health benefits from getting outside and moving. And so we're encouraging folks to do that on Wednesday. Um, it might, um, they can tweet at us, hashtag walk and roll NV, um, really just kind of keeping moving, but make, making sure that we're ensuring uh, social distancing, no gatherings outside of your family group or more than 10 folks, using face coverings whenever you're near others. Um, one of the things I think is beneficial of um, having a lower traffic volume and getting out and moving is this might be a really good time for anybody who wanted to try a bike commute. You might be able to test a couple of different ways on how you could get to the office on a bicycle if you live close enough. Um, this might be a really good time to do that, and you could try it out on a walk and roll Wednesday. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Swallow. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, uh, Commissioner. This is uh, Mayor Deborah March, and I just wanted to thank Director Swallow for her presentation on uh, how important safety is, especially at the time of the coronavirus. And I also just wanted to uh, remind the Director and Department of Transportation about the conversation that occurred at the last board meeting uh, where we discuss the Via Nobila interchange and, and just emphasize that uh, uh, Chairman Brown did point out that this was a very good time for us to pause and I think he emphasized that a few times to, to pause the item so that we have an opportunity to have a robust conversation around this. Uh, thank you for the reminder. Uh, we have essentially put it on pause to the extent that we can, but we wanted to make sure that we included your data. So. As we get uh, more information, we're putting that in so that when we have the robust conversation, we'll have all of the proper information in, in the model. What does, 
what does the word to the extent that we can represent? Because I, I know it's been removed from the federal stit, and that is a very, that's a huge concern for us in Henderson. So when I meant to the extent we can, we have, we are engaging with uh, your team in the discussion, and we want to make sure that we haven't completely stopped the work because we want to make sure that the land use data that you've provided is in, in our process. So we're incorporating that information so that when we are able to have the full discussion, we'll have your most current information in the model. Thank you. I appreciate that. So if I might just chime in, Mr. Chairman. Please. The, um, so I, I take that, um, Madam Director, to mean that um, the data that is being provided by the City of Henderson will in fact be considered in the context of a final decision about the number of um, interchanges on the I-15 coming out of West Henderson. I, the reason I ask that is not to play coy or to uh, create a conflict. I'm just concerned that the process has moved far enough along before we had a discussion in our last meeting that we just want to be con we want to be certain that in fact, the information that is being provided will be evaluated in the context of the final plan. We are using the information that has been provided by the city of Henderson. I, I crossed my terms a second ago where I said included in the model. We, um, it's not yet in the RTC model, but I, I know that the RTC is looking at that. In the meantime, we are looking at including the data and running analyses to see what the impact of that would be. So yes, we are including the land use data that we have received from the city of Henderson. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you, Director Swallow, MJ. The next item is to approve the consent agenda. This consists of items five through 13 and can be taken in one motion. I move approval. This is Jim Gibson. Is the motion on the floor? Let us take roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Marin Dubois again for the record. Please call out your vote after I read your name. Councilman Anthony. Yes. Councilman Barone. <laughs> Councilman Barone. I'll come back to you. Chair Brown. Yes. Councilman Galt. Yes. Commissioner Gibson. Aye. Mayor Goodman. Aye. Vice Chair March. Aye. Mayor McManus. Aye. Councilman Barone? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. We got your vote. Thank can you. you. Hear me? Mr. Chairman, that is all ayes. The, eye, the ayes have it. Motion carries. All right. Uh, thanks. Mr. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. MJ Maynard for the record. Items number 14, 15, and 16 will be introduced by Deputy CEO David Swallow. Thank you, MJ. Mr. Chairman, David Swallow, RDC Deputy CEO, for the record. Uh, I, I'm going to go through these items briefly, uh, and then we'll uh, go into detail for a, a combined vote on all three items. Item 14, determine a transportation planning emergency for the consideration of Regional Transportation Plan Amendments 19-27 and 20-02. Item number 15, approve amendment Clark 19-27 to the 2017-2040 to 2040 Regional Transportation Plan. And item 16, approve amendment Clark 20-02 to the 2017-2040 to 2040 Regional Transportation Plan. 
Item 14 is to determine a transportation planning emergency for the consideration of regional transportation plan amendments 19-27 and 20-02. Items 15 and 16 are the actual amendments to be considered for approval. The RTC's policies and procedures serve as guidelines for the funding and administration of projects under the RTC's jurisdiction. Section 9.6.1 of the policies and procedures prescribes that projects be submitted through the RTC's Executive Advisory Committee before being brought before the RTC Board of Commissioners for approval. In response to the Governor's Declaration of Emergency Directives issued in March 2020, the RTC canceled its regular meeting of the Executive Advisory Committee scheduled for March 26. This cancellation prevented the committee from approving the two amendments we bring before you today. However, per the RTC's policies and procedures, a transportation planning emergency determination will allow the board's consideration of the amendments. The two amendments include near-term and long-term projects that will not be able to proceed until they are included in the regional transportation plan. The amendments include projects that have available funding and are ready for engineering right away or construction. Maintaining project schedules is critical for the safe and efficient operation of the transportation systems. Both amendments were presented to the EAC previously and underwent a 30-day public comment period where no comments were received. Staff recommends approval of the amendments. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Swallow. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, entertain a motion. Motion to approve 14, 15, and 16. Can we, are we taking these all as one? Yes. yes, we are. Okay, so 14, 15, and 16, that would be my motion. There is a motion on the floor from Mayor March. Let us take roll call vote. Mayor Dubois, for the record, please call out your vote after I read your name. Councilman Anthony. Yes. Councilman Barone. Yes. Chair Brown. Yes. Councilman Galt. Yes. Commissioner Gibson. Yes. Mayor Goodman. Aye. Vice Chair March. Aye. Mayor McManus. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you have all ayes. All the ayes and the yeses have it. That motion carries. <laughs> Ms. Maynard. Thank you, Chairman. MJ Maynard for the record. The next two items will be presented by the RTC's Chief Financial Officer, Mark Trousdall. Thank you, MJ. Mark Trousdall, RTC Chief Financial Officer for the record. The regular meeting of the RTC Board of Commissioners is scheduled for May 14th, 2020. Nevada revised statute requires that the RTC set a public hearing for the tentative budget no sooner than the third Monday in May and no later than the last day of May. Instead of holding two separate meetings, staff recommends that the RTC reschedule its May meeting to a new date of May 21, 2020, to address normal business and conduct a public hearing for the budget. If the board approves the change, notification will be published. Thank you. Any questions from the board? If there are no questions, entertain a motion. That will be my motion. This is Mayor March. There is a motion on the floor from Mayor March. Let us take roll call vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mayor Dubois again for the record. Councilman Anthony. Councilman Anthony. Yes. Councilman Barone. Yes. Chair Brown. Yes. Councilman Galt. Yes. Commissioner Gibson. 
Aye. Mayor Goodman. Aye. Vice Chair March. Aye. Mayor McManus. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you have all ayes and yeses. The ayes and the yeses have it. That motion carries. <laughs> Mr. Trosdale, please continue. is a presentation on the tentative budget for fiscal year 2021. Could we go to the next slide on the budget fiscal year 2021? Thank you. Um, like everyone else, the RTC has economic and budgeting challenges during these difficult times. The RTC will file the tech budget prior to April 15 with the amounts prepared before the impact of COVID-19 and will prepare a new budget with updated estimates of revenues and expenditures that include the estimated impact of COVID-19 and bring the new budget back to the RTC board on May 21, 2020 for review and approval. We have engaged our financial advisors, Hobbs, Ong and Associates to analyze and provide some estimates of the impact of COVID-19 on our sales tax and fuel tax revenue. The projected impact to sales tax, fuel tax, and our passenger fare revenue is not certain at this time, but will be significant. Preliminary estimates have been called bleak and depressing. There are two things that will help us through this economic crisis and recession. The first is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, or CARES Act, that provides $25 billion to public transit agencies to help prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID-19 pandemic. The CARES Act apportionment for the RTC is $112 million and can be used for transit operating and equipment expenditures. RTC staff are currently researching grant requirements for reimbursement of transit expenses and have prepared and submitted the grant application. Second, the RTC has a cash reserve policy to maintain six months of operating expenses in the transit fund. This reserve is currently $120 million. I would like to briefly present what was budgeted prior to the impact of COVID-19 and some preliminary estimates of what the impact of COVID-19 might look like. The pie chart before you shows that we originally budgeted total sources of $827.2 million. This number will absolutely change in the final budget. Um, due to a less stable municipal bond market, the bond refunding for fiscal 21 of $125.7 million has been delayed from July 1, 2020 to a tentative date of October 2nd, 2020. The amounts on this slide are pre-COVID-19, uh, pre it's prior to the impact of COVID-19. And so this is what we're going to file with the state in our budget. We go to the next slide on sales and use tax revenues. You can see our original budget was $241 million. Uh, through December of 2019, sales tax was actually up 7.8% year-to-date. So we were projecting an increase of 5% for fiscal 20 and budgeting an increase of 3.5%. We go to the next slide. We see the impact of COVID-19 uh, reducing those numbers significantly. In FY20, we're projecting a decrease of $28 million or 12% from pre-COVID-19 projections. FY21, we're projecting a decrease of $57 million or 24% from pre-COVID-19 budgeted amounts. We go to the next slide. We look at the transit operating revenue. And again, these are... Um, pre-impact of the COVID-19. 
the sales tax reduction for the transit operating revenue uh, is estimated currently at $42.7 million. And that we're projecting currently that will go down to about $138.1 million. The fair revenue reduction is uh, estimated currently at $28.6 million. That will bring the fares down from 68.1 to 39.5. Again, these numbers are going to be very fluid over the next month, and we will update the budget, bring it back for approval with uh, actual COVID-19 impact numbers. As we go to the next slide, we see that we had budgeted 60.3 million with the impact of COVID-19, our current estimate is that that will drop to about $46.1 million. We go to the next slide. We can see the motor vehicle fuel tax that we, but we estimated uh, and budgeted for 21, $75.9 million. And if we look at the impact of COVID-19, the red bars that will appear, um, that drops 43.6% um, down to $42.8 million uh, for the motor vehicle fuel tax. We go to the next slide on uh, fuel revenue indexing one. We'll see a similar um, reduction there. If we click on that slide and see the red bars for our um, our uh, projected estimates at this time, you'll see again that this is also a 43.6% decline or an impact of $40.6 million. On the next slide, we look at our pre-COVID uh, budget for FRI2. And if we click on that slide, you'll see that will reduce down significantly. Um, the next slide is our fair revenue. And if we look at that slide, uh, we budgeted about $65 million of revenue there. If we click on that, you'll see what that is made up of, uh, $50.7 million in the general market and $14.3 million on the Las Vegas Strip. We click on that and the red bars show up. If you'd click on that again, there we go you can see that the impact uh, to those fair revenues is quite drastic. We're looking at a decrease of $13.9 million from our original FY20 projections. And we're looking at a $28.6 million reduction in FY21. We go to the next slide and look at the expenditures that we're budgeting. Uh, this is what we're going to spend a lot of our time on over the next month in uh, preparing a new budget for fiscal 21. We're going to analyze each of these um, expenditures and uh, bring back to the board a new amount for total expenditures. Capital outlay, the next slide, um, at $297 million, we will also restate those. On the brighter side, if we look at the next slide, we can uh, have a moment of celebration for completing all 225 projects for FY for the uh, FRI-1. We uh, like to thank all of our partners, the local jurisdictions. They have finished the construction in, on all 20, 225 projects. And I'd like to thank the public works directors and their staff for all the time and effort they spent toward this momentous achievement that has reduced congestion, increased capacity, and enhanced safety for the public. They worked hand-in-hand -hand with the contracting community to maintain and build new roads and bridges. Thank you all for your hard work and dedication. Lastly, I'd like to recognize John Penuelis, RTC Senior Director of Engineering, and Joe Damiani, RTC Engineering Manager for moving this program along to the benefit of our residents and visitors. Thank you. We go to the next slide. We will look at the um, original budget that we prepared for transit capital, that $132 million. And of that amount of uh, capital, 
we would anticipate grant funding $103.6 million. And again, we're going to reevaluate that as we go through these capital expenditures on the next slides. We can see that we're budgeting for 40 double deck buses and uh, 20 40 foot fixed route buses and 10 60 foot fixed route buses. We'll be looking, analyzing at uh, these procurements to see where we can delay or uh, reduce those procurements. Um, one candidate for this, we were anticipating to buy two 40 foot battery electric vehicles to test those in our system. And uh, we might be delaying those, uh, the procurement of those two electric buses. We'll also be analyzing our CNG fueling equipment and our bus shelters. On the next slide, we can uh, see that we have some facility improvements at the IBMF and the SMF, the, buff, the bus yards. Um, we will look at those equipment upgrades to see if we can delay or delete some of those. And we will be looking at our technology upgrades of 15.9 million to see if we can delay or delete some of those projects. Uh, the next slide shows uh, our outstanding bonds in fiscal 21. Um, these do not go away, unfortunately, with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And you can see here that we have $626 million in outstanding debt. And the next slide shows our debt service. We will have to pay $90.2 million in debt service in fiscal 21. Our uh, budgeted operating expenditures, we will be analyzing these very closely. And they are anticipated to decline with the decline of ridership in our uh, fixed route system, both on the strip and in the general market. If we look at the uh, fixed route contract cost, we had budgeted that in fiscal 21 at $124.1 million. We click on that slide, you'll see that we're estimating a reduction in that expenditure to $101 million. If we go to the next slide, we see um, the fixed route service hours that we were anticipating. And if we click on that one to look at the uh, red bars that will estimate what we think COVID-19's impact on that will be, we're down to 1.4 million uh, service hours, which is a significant decrease in service in our system. We look at the paratransit contract, it's a little bit different of a story. Um, we did budget $56.3 million in expenditures for the paratransit system. We click on that one, you can see we're only reducing that down to 56.1. And that is due to, we anticipate a higher demand uh, for paratransit than we do fixed route that during this time, our paratransit ridership is currently down, will probably remain down for several months, but we expect uh, some uh, bounce back, if you will, in that service in that people have probably postponed several trips that they'll need to take. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you can see the, tra the projected transit fuel cost, what we had budgeted. Um, and if we click on that one to see the impact, You'll see that it's gone down about a million dollars a year um, in anticipation of uh, reduced uh, service hours in our system. Um, that concludes my prepared remarks. Again, I'd like to re remind the board that our strategy here is to submit our pre-COVID-19 impact budget and re uh, prepare a new budget to bring back to the board on May 21 for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, do we have any comments or questions from the board? Well, Chairman Brown, this is Mayor March. I, I wanted to uh, thank staff for looking at places where they can reduce costs in the future, going ahead and uh, maybe suspending some procurements and refinancing bonds. And, and I was wondering on the grant funding, is that the COVID grants or are those grants that were already coming in the 103.6 million? 
Yeah, those were uh, our regular grant program, our regular apportionment that we normally use for capital projects. Okay, so we're still pursuing, though, the COVID uh, grant opportunities that might help us to, to shore up some of our budget. Oh, absolutely. We are aggressively looking at all opportunities for uh, stimulus funding for the RTC. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor March. Any other questions from the board? I will entertain a motion. I move to approval, Mr. Chair. There's a motion on the floor from Commissioner Gibson. Could we take our roll call vote? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Marin Dubois, for the record. Please call out your vote after I read your name. Councilman Anthony. Councilman Anthony? Yes. Councilman Barone? Yes. Chair Brown? Yes. Councilman Galt? Yes. Commissioner Gibson? Aye. Mayor Goodman? Aye. Vice Chair March? Aye. Mayor McManus? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you have all ayes and yeses. And they carry the motion passes. Ms. Maynard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. MJ Maynard for the record. Item 19 is your closed door session. There are no legal items to discuss, so we can skip this item and move on to your last item, which is number 20. The last item on the agenda is your final citizen's participation. This is the second time set aside for public comment. Just a reminder that comments will be limited, 500 words, with the remaining words to be included in the written record. And before I go to Eileen for any comments, I just want to wish uh, uh, my colleagues, staff, and our citizens a blessed Passover and Easter. Uh, stay healthy, stay home. Eileen, comments from the general public. Thank you, Chairman Brown. This is Eileen Pastor, RTC Government Affairs Supervisor. For the record, we have a total of four public comments. The first public comment is from Don Johnson with MV Transportation. MV Transportation is committed to providing safe and reliable transportation for our passengers and our operators during this unique and challenging time. Both at the corporate and local level, our company is closely monitoring developments of the COVID-19 outbreak and following all Senator Centers for Disease Control, CDC, and local public health guidelines. As a result, we have made a number of adjustments to our processes and policies in support of social distancing guidelines, in addition to implementing enhanced standards to protect our passengers and our operators. At the outset of the outbreak, we began an awareness campaign to encourage employees to follow the advice of the CDC and ensure that they wash their hands frequently, and when soap is not available, utilize hand sanitizer. This ongoing awareness program also included directions to not come to work when sick and to contact their health care provider. We implemented enhanced daily cleaning of buses and paratransit vehicles the first week of March with CDC compliant hospital grade disinfectants that had been proven to be effective against viruses like COVID-19. This process includes cleaning seats, seat belts, seat frames, stanchions, doors, bus interior surfaces, wheelchair lifts and controls, floors and the entire driver's area, including the instrument panel. Similarly, we are cleaning our operational facilities daily with multiple cleaning of high touch areas. We provide our drivers and support staff with personal protection equipment, PPE, including gloves, hand sanitizer, and face coverings. While these items are in critical short supply, we have been able to leverage our national partnerships to successfully source these items. For example, a shipment of 140,000 face masks will arrive today in Las Vegas to support the MV team. 
For added safety, we are further limiting possible exposure for our drivers with social distance practices, such as regular use of driver safety doors and implementation of rear door entry bus access. During this unique and challenging time, MV looks forward to continued close collaboration and partnership with the RTC and providing safe and reliable transportation for the Las Vegas community. The second public comment is from Mark Perla, General Manager with Keolis. At Keolis, safety of our employees and our passengers is our number one priority. As the coronavirus impacts our state and cities, it is imperative that we protect our employees who play such a vital role to our public. Keolis knows that essential workers, first responders, healthcare professionals, and the community at large need safe and reliable transportation to get to where they need to go. We are dedicated to ensuring that public transit is the safest alternative. In doing so, we provide our drivers and support staff with personal protection equipment, PPE, including gloves, hand sanitizer, and germicidal wipes and face coverings. While these items are in critical short supply, we have been able to successfully source these items from our respective suppliers. For added safety, we are further limiting possible exposure with our drivers with social distance practices, such as regular use of driver safety doors, and thanks to the leadership of RTC, implemented rear door entry bus access. Our employees are also updated routinely on the coronavirus, its impacts, and safety procedures to minimize exposure while maintaining the front line. Keolis, being both a national and international company with contracts in Europe, India, Australia, and China, to name a few, is also interacting with our entire network to fine-tune best practices and safety procedures for our Las Vegas operation. Additionally, we continue to maintain a strong partnership with RTC to ensure that we deliver safe and reliable services to our employees and public. Thank you. For Thank your time and leadership during these trying times. I wish all of you good health. The third public comment is from Stephanie Versnick. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Stephanie Versnick, and I'm speaking to you for the 26th time. I have been asking this commission to expand the service area for more than two years. This is a very challenging time for our community. We are all practicing social distancing and trying to get used to a different way of living. I know that the safety of everyone's lives is a priority. I would like to thank all the brave men and women that are on the front lines every day who continue to work and keep our community going, including the RTC and paratransit drivers that are continuing to provide much needed transportation for this community. Thank you. My son is on the front lines also. He is considered essential and continues to work at the commissary, making sure our military members have groceries for their families. He goes to work wearing a mask and gloves. It's a very scary and different world we live in today. I'm picking him up at the library. We are practicing all the guidelines of the CDC to stay safe. I would just like to remind this commission when the pandemic is over and things slowly begin to return to some form of normalcy, I would still want to explore a reasonable premium service plan option. I would like to have the option to pay a reasonable premium price to receive transportation for my son. Ultimately, I would like to see the service area expanded to meet the needs of this community. Stay safe, everyone, and we will get through this together. The fourth public comment is from Robin Kincaid. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Robin Kincaid, and I have shared with the board in the past how the service area restrictions in, in have the affected my daughter, Kayla Kincaid's access to her church, friends, and potential employment opportunities. Certainly, we recognize this very serious time that we are living in and the enormous risk that many of the RTC contractors have taken to provide services. These employees are among the heroes providing essential services. Unfortunately, this pandemic period has been exasperated for some individuals with disabilities who still can't access essential services because their prescription is only available in an out-of-area pharmacy or need to go to another store that is outside the service area. I pray we never have any future opportunities to discover that people with disabilities cannot get the things that they need. 
May we all continue with the CDC's recommendation for social distancing so that, we, that way we can prevent the spread of this horrible virus. In doing so, perhaps we can begin to restore our wonderful city to its pre-pandemic state. I wish all of you good health. And that is the final citizens' participation. Thank you. <clears throat> that concludes the public comment period. And if there are no additional comments, we'll close that item. And thank you all. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This meeting is no longer being recorded.